In this episode, I take my space game prototype and attempt to turn it into a real game. But can I actually make it work without a third-party game engine? Or will I get stuck in the weeds trying to reinvent the wheel? In the last episode, I made my first real attempt at creating a game prototype without using a major game engine. With the help of Raylib and the Odin programming language, I was able to start bringing my ideas to life. And while the systems were primitive, working at this level was fascinating. But I was still struggling to really come to grips with Odin and this type of programming. So I decided to port my work into a little obscure language called C++. By now, I had written the basics of Astro I mean Space Game in C and Odin, so it was fairly straightforward to get things underway in C++. And once I had the basics working, I thought I'd have a shot at replacing some of the basic shapes with textures. There were a few comments on episode 7, some people preferred the basic shapes to the artwork that I teased in the ending, but a lot of the work you're about to see actually happened before episode 7 was published. So while it might seem like we're in the present, we're actually still in the past. What happened then? The past then? When? Just now. We're at now now. Speaking of now, I now have a Discord server, and the prototypes featured in past videos are available to play now and discuss for the future. 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 See you there. Anyway, back to the artwork. I whipped up some very basic sprites for testing. I was mostly concerned with how to manage and draw textures in Raylib. So if something looks bad in this video, it's all part of the plan. Plan, plan. One of my favorite tools in game design is the trusty particle system. I didn't really know how a particle system worked, so I just started with something basic. And it was basic. At its heart, I figured a particle system is just a bunch of parameters and an array of particles, and each particle would need to be moved by some velocity and perhaps change color or size over time. Raylib does some helpful stuff under the hood, batching texture draw calls to the GPU, meaning you can draw thousands of textures in one draw call, as long as they are the same. I experimented by making hundreds of particle systems, processing and rendering tens of thousands of particles. This basic system took around 4 milliseconds to render 90,000 particles. Not bad for a first attempt. I even had a little play with Fast Noise Light, a header-only noise algorithm, and after some failed attempts, I got the particles to start swirling about. It wasn't perfect, but it was fun. fun, fun, fun. Something I had struggled with using other game engines was finding a way to create some endless procedural clouds for the background. Looks like ass. And while this was a cosmetic issue, I was still interested in a solution. The high-tech stars in my current background were just points in space, each multiplied by a random parallax value. And then if they went off the edge of the screen, they would wrap around to the other side. So I just followed that approach, but with clouds. They could be different sizes though, and instead of drawing rectangles, they would draw a cloud texture. But it didn't work straight away. In fact, it took a lot longer than I'm comfortable admitting to calculate properly when a cloud had reached the end of the screen and needed to move to the other side. But eventually, we got there. With each cloud having a random parallax value, we essentially had an endless variation of clouds as the player traversed the vastness of space. 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 It looks a little bit bad here, but I did improve the cloud texture a lot as time went on. Now that we had cracked the code for endless clouds, I went back and experimented with some art tests using my secret weapon of choice, Pixel Composer. Composer. This helped a lot to create art quickly and more procedurally. I had big plans for the actual game design, but at this point I was still deep in the weeds of the base systems, one of the harsh realities of making a game without an established engine. While working on some input stuff, I had a go at adding controller support, which with Raylib was pretty straightforward and worked out of the box when I plugged in my PS5 controller. Sometimes you've just got to fly about for a while and get a feel for what it's like to exist in this little cosmos you've created. 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 And then sometimes when you're testing things, you realize your frame rates are having conniptions and you ask yourself, why? why? 
I did a little CPU profiling and digging in, I could see that there was a huge amount of time being spent in the steering process. And of course, because I was using a C++ vector, the messaging was a bit cryptic, but it led me to spot a silly bug, one that was very easy to create by accident. When an enemy ship gathered a list of neighbors, it then calculated its desired velocity using this data. The issue was simply that I was copying that list of neighbors into the steering function. Thousands of ships copying thousands of lists every frame. What I needed was a pointer to this data, or better yet, a const reference. They say premature optimization is the root of all evil, but I still wanted to check what kind of limits my system had as I went along, both to make sure my design was viable and to learn what type of overheads I had to work with. Around this time, I was able to simulate around 1500 enemies without dropping below 60 frames per second. When using established game engines, it's easy to take for granted basic tools. For example, how does raycasting work? In particular, 2D raycasting. Raycasting is when you want to know if a ray going from some point in some direction intersects with colliders in the world. After some discourse with Copilot and by stepping through the pre-existing simulation grid, I was able to cast rays into the scene and get back the exact collision point on the circle it collided with. Handy for things like beam weapons, and don't ask me how the math works. Something that I was always interested in was adding Bloom. In the very first prototype, way back in Unity, adding Bloom to the laser bolts, particles and explosions made things feel more bright and alive. Surely this wouldn't be too hard to implement, right? Turns out Bloom is a little more complicated than ticking a couple of boxes and away you go. Bloom is a topic of great interest to game developers and has gone through some interesting evolutions over the years some better than others. There are some great videos on this topic that go in depth, and while researching them, I managed to implement a whole range of dodgy, ugly bloom effects. In the end, I went through the process of creating a MIP chain bloom, which was pretty involved, but ended up creating a nice enough looking bloom. As the project developed, I could never have enough debug information. I was drawing all of this using Ray GUI, GUI an GUI. additional UI header from the author of Raylib. But if I'm honest, I couldn't get it working across the whole project. This is a header include skill issue. So I turned to another well-established GUI library, Dear I am GUI. GUI, GUI, GUI. There were some setup steps to get I am GUI working nicely with Raylib using another small wrapper library called RL I am GUI. GUI, GUI. But other than that, the process was pretty straightforward. And while you can do a lot without an editor, with I am GUI in the project, I started to wonder how one might approach some other basic editor tools. And the first thing I wanted to try was an enemy creator, effectively bypassing the current spreadsheet JSON import madness that I had in place. To be fair, GitHub Copilot was very helpful when learning the I am GUI workflow, and I was able to put together a basic window that would have some fields for steering data and texture loading. I made a little pop-up window that would allow me to edit where on the ship the trails and weapons could stem from. As I started to add in some ability to edit enemy weapons, I had to stop and take a long hard look at how the core systems had been created. Weapons and projectiles in particular were a mess, with a complicated waterfall of data and an annoying cascade of constructors. Basically, I needed to rework the way entities and their components were managed. I know what you're thinking, we need an entity component system but I didn't really understand what that was. So I just followed my own instincts to make some basic data systems that worked for Space Game. So over the next couple of weeks, I did some major surgery to the core of the entity systems. And I created a system to handle components in a more straightforward way. It definitely broke the game for many days, but the refactoring offered some major improvements. All of the different systems could be converted into components. Steering, trails, particles, colliders, transforms, sprites, and weapons. It made things much easier to work with. With things mostly back in an operational state, I got to work adding to the newly organized weapon systems. I managed to add weapons back onto enemies properly this time, and create turret weapons that could rotate on their own. As a reward for this hard work on systems, I drew up some new working sprites for weapons and for the player ship, Mm, maybe that's a bit too alien. Let's try something a bit more Terran. Enemies now could have beam weapons, bolt weapons, and even fire torpedoes. And because of the way everything flowed through the physics system, it wasn't hard to make torpedoes targetable and destroyable. 
By this time I had released episode 7 and received some feedback about the graphics. And while I didn't feel ready to revert everything back to basic shapes, it gave me an idea to work on a radar system. Basically from the point of view of another more zoomed out camera, I could render asteroids and enemies as basic shapes to a render texture. Then with some wrangling, render that texture down to a radar UI element. Add a little bloom and we have a screen like effect showing the world around the player. Things were really starting to come together. After just five short months, I had managed to make something that took around 10 days in Unity. Well, to be fair, this version of Space Game was by far my favorite and had a few more mechanics such as beam weapons, torpedoes, and different enemies. I had also managed to create some sort of bespoke, albeit basic engine just for Space Game and had learned so much in the process. And at the end of the day, isn't learning really why we do this game development thing? The answer is no. I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't totally immersed in this project and had quietly forgotten about my original mission statement, to make prototypes and then pick one to make a proper game from. I was going to need some sort of distraction to pull myself out of the void of space game. Space game, space game. In the next episode of DevQuest, I take a break from space game and enter the Raylib Next Game Jam, a challenging jam hosted by the author of Raylib. I'll need to make a game from scratch using only Raylib, and I'll have just seven days to do it. Oh, that makes me think, what if you had multiple things and you got to connect the things to the things? Just continue doing it. Just be bad at programming until you're good. Read this and tell me what this thing is doing. Template class edit class alloc enable if conjunction v is iterator edit is allocator. I don't need a game engine, I need a train engine. Trains solved. We have solved train programming. Here you go, babe. What do you think? I love it. Go submit it, man, before the time runs out. Yeah, good call. How do we do it?